people were hospitalised with injuries, including a fractured nose, cuts, bruises, a fractured jaw and permanent eye damage. Mr Gangitano was then granted bail with a $10,000 surety, a night curfew and an order to seek psychiatric treatment. A teenage boy by the name of Alphonse John Gangitano was watching Al Capone movies and dreaming of becoming a gangster. He was a private school boy, posh, wannabe gangster. Before long, Gangitano attracted police attention. He ran with a gang of thugs, bashing people in the streets as he sought to establish turf like the gangsters he'd seen in the movies. He set out to attract the attention, if not the respect, of Melbourne's most notorious criminals. I was the first bloke to ever give him a, a sort of shotgun. My old man gave it to me. And I gave it to uh, Alphonse when I got a handgun. And um, Alphonse thought it was great, you know. Gangitano could never have imagined that his friendship with Chopper would one day turn sour and that the man who gave him his first gun would try to kill him. But before that day of reckoning came, Gangitano pursued his gangster status by targeting off-duty cops. He and his thugs, usually three or four of them, would go to nightclubs and they'd give the off-duty police officer a fearful hiding. Put him in hospital for two or three months. One of Gangitano's main MOs, he hated police, and that's how he squared up. Melbourne, Victoria. There is another Melbourne you won't find in the tourist marketing. It's controlled and run by a powerful criminal underworld that enforces its will with fear and violence. Mickey's Disco was a favourite St Kilda hangout for Melbourne's criminal underworld. Criminals from as far as Darwin, Brisbane, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, everybody visited there. It was just the right place to be in those years. It was here that Chris Flannery and Alphonse Gangitano would meet. Mr Wilson was last seen here at the factory premises at the corner of Currajong Street and Robs Road in Footscray on Friday night. He was working late with other company executives evaluating a new product. He is said to have been very enthused by the product and was in high spirits. Flannery and an accomplice grabbed Roger Wilson as he left his business and pretended they were police officers. They handcuffed him, they put him in the back of the car, they drove him away to a remote location emptied the entire revolver into him. Killed him and buried him. At this time, Gangitano, now 22, was hanging around Mickey's disco, ingratiating himself with his criminal elders. Alphonse Gangitano uh, admired Flannery, who to him as a street fighting man would have been an A-lister when he was an up-and-comer. Flannery used that to his advantage and gave Gangitano a job that would test his mettle. It was up to Gangitano and one or two others. They were sent up there to where this body was buried. They, uh, they dug it up, it must have been a grisly job of itself, and, uh, and reburied it in another spot. He was showing to Flannery that he had the, he had the dash. He was showing that, you know, that, that he, he could do what had to be done. And he certainly developed that reputation. Wilson's body was never found, but police believed they had enough evidence to prosecute. Their case rested on the testimony of Deborah Boundy. She'd overheard Flannery and her boyfriend, Kevin Williams, describing Wilson's murder in detail. Flannery wanted her gone, and he had just the man for the job. He liked to sit Shillers down with a, a, a bag of pure. She would overdose with uh, pure Chinese white. She killed herself. They just supplied the uh, heroin for her, the uh, pure for her, and sat there and watched her do it. Her death achieved its aim. Without a witness, the case collapsed and Flannery walked free from court. And Gangitano was now a man to be reckoned with. Gangitano might have worn expensive Italian suits and projected an image of wealth but he had a crippling gambling addiction and mounting debt. He believed he could make some serious coin through boxing and an up-and-coming fighter named Lester Ellis. Ellis had a meteoric rise, winning his first world title championship at the age of 19. A year later, when Michael challenged Ellis for the title, 
Gangitano planned to bet heavily on Ellis. Gangitano rang me and said, oh, do you need more tickets for the fight? This was about a month out from the fight. And I said, uh, Alphonse, I said, stop backing him. I said, I've, I've, today I made the weight and I've sparred 15 rounds with four opponents. And he said, Barry, he said, I love you like a brother. You and Les love Lester like a brother. I'm not backing, I'm not betting against either. And I said, Alphonse, I know you're backing Lester. Stop backing Lester, he can't beat me. It's been a good round for Michael, a good left to the head, the left into the body. Even before the decision was announced, it was obvious to everyone who'd won, even Michael and Ellis. As you can see, Keith Ellis, he's the new IBF World Junior Lightweight Champion. Alphonse lost a lot of money on the fight and sought retribution. With the help of his cronies, he attacked Barry Michael in a nightclub. I've turned around for the first time and I'm surrounded. And the first thing I thought was, I'm, I'm off. There was at least eight guys surrounding me with death in their eyes. I knew they carried guns. If I turned to Alphonse and I said, you effing so-and-so, you've set me up. I was wearing a suit and tie and he just lunged at me and he grabbed me by the lapels of my jacket and pulled me down on the couch with him. And as he pulled me down the couch with him, he latched onto my right cheek with his teeth and he got a serious grip on my cheek and I, got my hands up trying to gouge his eyes to get him off me and immediately they were like a pack of mongrel dogs on top of me bashing me and biting me. I had bite marks on my back. My nose was smashed, that scar on the bridge of my nose is, is from that, that evening and it was smashed right across under my left eye. It was a really serious break. Eventually I remember someone saying he's had enough, he's had enough. The next thing I know I'm being dragged through the crowd with blood spraying everywhere off my face and people screaming and, uh, and basically getting to the front door and just being pushed out into the, into the street. It was yet another example of Gangitano's capacity for violence, a trait that would ultimately result in his own death. Gangitano habitually used cocaine, and while Alphonse dabbled in the trade, he was more of a consumer than a supplier and soon suffered from drug-induced paranoia. On December 19, 1995, he and his mate Jason Moran were attempting to extort money from the sports bar nightclub in Melbourne. Then Gangitano snapped using pool cues and a metal bar. He savagely bashed the club's patrons. Rumours that Gangitano was going to plead guilty rippled through the underworld. This would leave Jason Moran facing a certain jail sentence. Threatening to turn on your mates seldom works out well. Brian Murphy heard that Gangitano was in the crosshairs and went to warn him. We got over there and Alphonse is sitting there like Lord of the Manor. He uh, clicked his fingers and he, uh, this little puppet, the ponytail comes running over and he goes, he opens the cigarette, fair to him, he lived B-grade films. And the bloke put a cigarette in his mouth and lit it and he go, out, out of the way. And I said to him, listen, you, you know, you, you, you're well and surely going to get knocked. I said, you've robbed all your mates. And uh, that's what led to his demise. And he said, there's no way I'm going to get knocked. He said, they're my buddies. Crime figure Alphonse Gangitano was gunned down in his Templestowe home. His wife found him lying in a pool of blood in the laundry. He'd been shot three times in the head and body. His killer has not been found. It seems to have been a decision to, as they say in the underworld, tug his coat. Um, uh, Graham Kinnebra was a well-known mediator. Um, he was uh, renowned for resolving things without violence. Um, it's alleged that he and Jason Moran went to um, Gangitano's house in Templestowe for a discussion. Former homicide detective Charlie Bazina was assigned to investigate Gangitano's murder. Indications are he then walked into the house, obviously well known to Alphonse, he was allowed in, and Alphonse greeted him at the door in his underpants. Anyone else or someone that Alphonse didn't know certainly wouldn't have been allowed access. I believe at that stage that Jason Moran had uh, pulled a pistol shot uh, Alphonse. Now what that argument was over, we'll never ever know. He was shot several times in his underpants in his laundry. Hardly a, a glorious end for the, uh, the gangster that he'd like to have been known as. 